Bé, bon, bon vespre. <coughs> mentre, mentre tota Europa la gent s'està posant el pijama per, per anar a dormir, eh, aquí estem, eh, a, a Girona, <coughs> en un acte que té connotació i Girona més, sí, amb, amb, un acte que té evidents connotacions de, de nocturnitat, no? I no és, no és culpa meva, eh? I'm sorry about that. Vull dir, vull dir i declarar quasi d'entrada que potser poques vegades haurà valgut tant la pena fugir dels o sortir dels horaris convencionals per conversar amb l'autor d'un llibre. Ho dic amb total convicció i sé que els que sou aquí, que hàgiu llegit aquest llibre extraordinari, teniu la sensació segur d'estar visquent una situació de privilegi. Per tant, Filip Sanz, benvingut a Girona i benvingut al Festival Mot. La puc aplaudir. Filip, en francès, Filip Sanz és catedràtic de dret a la University College, a la Universitat de Londres, un reconegut expert en qüestions de dret internacional, especialment relacionades amb el medi ambient i també amb tot el que afecta a crims contra la humanitat o genocidi. Potser val la pena dir que en la política del seu país és un fervent militant contra el Brexit, diguéssim, per parlar de política actual i de les seves conseqüències podríem parlar amb ell de moltes coses que estic segur que acabaran sortint en les preguntes al final de molt d'interès. Ell ha tingut intervencions directes i indirectes en casos tan espectaculars del punt de vista del dret internacional com va ser, per exemple, el la no immunitat de Pinochet, quan Pinochet va anar a Londres i alguns d'aquí recordaran que va estar uns mesos finalment humiliat gràcies al dret internacional, etc. Tindrem, espero, ocasió de parlar de Pinochet i tal. Ha tingut actuacions en els casos de Ruanda després, Irak, Guantánamo, etc. Etc. En parlarem, jo crec, després de tot això. Però comencem centrant-nos en el llibre que ens ocupa avui. Jo portava uns llibres que no sé si coneixeu, però el lector en castellà o en català ha tingut ocasió de llegir aquest llibre, El Príncipe Rojo, no sé si no l'heu llegit, és un llibre recomanable. L'interessant és que és un llibre d'un historiador però és un llibre... Diu, no, dius poc? Sí, que on es parla dels mateixos llocs i de la mateixa època del que parla en el seu llibre el Filip Sanz. Ara, això és la versió, diguem-ne, d'un historiador. Després, i això ja és més sensacional, tenim un altre, un llibre extraordinari de literatura catalana i escrit per un novel·lista. Aquest no el coneixes. No el coneixes perquè si hi hagués justícia al món i les llengües minoritàries no estessin fagocitades per la llengua anglesa, doncs aquest llibre seria un best-seller internacional. Es diu Gegants de gel, editat per edicions del Periscopi. I què passa? Doncs que això és una visió novel·lada, novel·lada de ficció, del mateix que es parla en el llibre del Filip Sanz. És una... En aquest llibre, la protagonista, o una de les protagonistes, es diu Dominika Maltsevska, nascuda on? A l'Evip. I, en canvi, és novel·lat, no? Després entendrem per què això és tan significatiu. És fascinant llegir el llibre d'en Joan Benesiu al cantó del llibre del Filip Sanz. 
Si, si el Philip Sanz, que ha escrit els dos llibres anteriors, i ara ens presentés aquest, diríem, hombre, i ara al final ha culminat una trilogia extraordinària. Primer va fer un llibre d'historiador, després va escriure una novel·la i finalment, finalment ha escrit eh, una, una culminació d'aquest procés no? que eh, respondria exactament al moto d'aquest festival, aquesta idea de la literatura encarnada. No? Mm? Allò que el comissari d'aquest any, Josep Ramoneda, descriu amb, amb paraules de, de ressonàncies bíbliques, no sé què passa, eh, eh, quan diu literatura encarnada és aquella que vol testimoniar la realitat que ens envolta, ja sigui en l'ambient de l'experiència privada o col·lectiva. I així l'escriptura es fa carn i evita entre nosaltres. Doncs bé, aquest llibre de Philip Sanz constitueix un exemple excels d'aquest concepte de literatura encarnada perquè hi conflueix tot, hi conflueixen eh, les arrels familiars, l'interès professional sobre el dret internacional, és a dir, és un, és un tractat de dret, si voleu, eh, la història d'un espai, una petita ciutat que es diu Levip, però que ha tingut altres noms, després en parlarem, un petit, una petita ciutat que avui és Ucraïna, que ha estat Polònia, que ha estat sota el règim soviètic, que ha estat sota el règim nazi, etc. etc. És un, una ciutat al cor d'Europa, una vella ciutat de l'imperi austrohúngar, on eh, doncs, si és sanif... Si han escenificat diguéssim, els ismes més intensos i, i més, més salvatges del, del segle passat. No? Però sobretot, perquè estem en un festival de literatura, aquest llibre funciona, i funciona especialment... Això, perquè és al mateix temps un exercici de control i precisió narrativa que converteix això en una novel·la, una novel·la real, novel·la real extraordinària. No? Eh, és a dir, eh, ell ha organitzat una sèrie de, de... És a dir, és un llibre híbrid eh, de gèneres, però que eh, funciona perfectament perquè està organitzat eh, en funció dels mecanismes narratius propis de la ficció. La qual no vol dir, no vol pas dir que quan dic mecanismes propis, narratius propis de la ficció, no vull pas dir que s'hi expliquin coses ficcionals. Tot el contrari, el llibre és profundament testimonial i es basa en un volum de recerca que és aclaparador. Eh? Eh, el que passa és que Philip Sanz ha aconseguit el, el, el petit miracle d'allò que Paul Riquer en deia encapsular el temps històric en un temps narratiu, eh? que no és poca cosa. Està ple de gent que té coses interessantíssimes per explicar, noi? però si no les encapsulem en un temps narratiu, que és el que fa la ficció, eh? doncs la cosa no funciona. I aquest és el, el gran miracle d'aquest llibre, no? I estàs de, està d'acord, si sí, no? El... <laughs> Sí, amb, amb... Si It's a miracle. Coses... sí, bàsicament estic dient coses agradables sobre el llibre <laughs> i sobre el d'això. Però, en fi, eh, han vingut a escoltar en el, en el Filip i tinc molt d'interès a això. Jo li, eh, us proposo que fem un exercici, Filip, si, si estàs d'acord, eh, que tenim molts temes, ja veureu, però primer poder que ens donem tots un cert context. No? I llavors jo li proposo que ens faci per començar, una mena de, de petits perfils sobre eh, una sèrie de... un lloc, aquesta ciutat que es diu Levip, i una sèrie de personatges de l'obra, també tots que comencen amb L. Eh? Hi ha moltes L, és un llibre de L. Eh? Eh, llavors, jo començaria a demanar-li que ens ajudi a situar Levip, aquesta petita ciutat de, de l'actual Ucraïna, en el mapa geogràfic, històric i polític. 
i que ens expliqui per què d'alguna manera l'aventura d'aquest llibre, per què tot comença a l'EVIP. Ok. Thank you, Miquel. It's incredibly nice to be here and I want to thank uh, the organizers of this wonderful festival uh, for having given me an opportunity to come back to Hirona. I know this area well. I have friends who live here, so I'm incredibly pleased to come. I think to begin at the beginning, you need to take yourself back to 2010. In April 2010, out of the blue, I received an invitation to give a lecture on the work that I do as a lawyer, as a barrister, and as a university professor on two concepts, crimes against humanity and genocide. What's the difference between the two? Both were invented in 1945. Crimes against humanity is about protecting individual human beings, each of us, because we are individual human beings with minimum rights. Genocide is about protecting us as members of groups. The two concepts have different objectives. And I got an invitation, as I said, to talk about the work that I do. I've done a lot of cases about crimes against humanity and genocide. The invitation came from a very obscure university in a very obscure town in a very obscure country. The university was the law faculty in a town which today is called Lviv and which is in the western Ukraine. Lviv used to be Lvov when it was in Poland and Lemberg when it was in Nazi Germany and for 172 years in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It's in the district of Galicia, a different Galicia from your Spanish Galicia. Would I come and give a lecture, said the university, law faculty. Yes, I said, I would be very pleased to come and give a lecture. Um, and the real reason for giving the lecture had absolutely nothing to do with my desire to give yet another lecture on mass murder, which I do a lot of, but because my grandfather was born in that city in 1904. It was called Lemberg then. It was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And I knew that he had been born there. And although he lived until 1997, he never talked about it. In fact, he never talked about anything that happened before 1945. Uh, like many parts of the world, Spain is no different. Uh, where terrible things have happened, people tend to keep silent about them. So I thought that would be really interesting to go and see what the place is like. And so I accepted. I spent the summer of 2010 in part writing the lecture and doing the research for the lecture. And I accidentally came across two astonishing facts. The first astonishing fact was that the man who invented the concept of crimes against humanity in international law and put it into the Nuremberg Charter in 1945, his name was Hirsch Lauterpacht and he was a professor at Cambridge University, actually came from the same city of Lviv, Lemberg and actually studied as a student at the law faculty which had invited me, but the people who had invited me did not know. So I thought, that's pretty weird. You know, that's a sort of pretty amazing coincidence that they ask you to come and give a lecture about the origins of these topics and it starts in their city. And so I carried on with my research. And the second astonishing coincidence that I came across was that the man who invented the concept of genocide, the protection of groups, a different type of mass murder, Raphael Lemkin, once a Polish prosecutor of criminal law, came from Lviv, <laughs> studied at the same law school, and they didn't know about it. So I thought, how amazing that they asked me to come and give this lecture and it starts in their law school. 
in their small town. So when I arrived in October 2010, as you can imagine, first they were surprised, then they were happy, then they started putting pictures up on the walls <laughs> of these two men, which was not an easy thing to do because the city today is Ukrainian. And the two men were Polish and Jewish. And what I realized was that I had stumbled across a big story about identity. East West Street, KSD West Street, is really about identity. And it's about who we are, which right now in Catalonia, Spain, Europe is a big issue. How do we define ourselves? I listened to André Akin say in the previous session that actually identity, we know who we are. I don't agree with that. I don't think we do know who we are. And each of us in this room will define ourselves in different ways. Are we first and foremost an individual? Or are we first and foremost a member of a group? And which group? Catalonian? Spanish? European? International? Who am I? Am I English? Am I French? Am I white? Am I male? Am I Jewish? I mean, how do I define myself? It's a question that everyone asks themselves. But the related question is, if the law is going to protect you, do you want the law to protect you because you're a human being? Or do you want the law to protect you because you're a member of a group that deserves protection? And that is a big, <coughs> big question then in 1945 and again today. So just to take the story forward, I come back, six months pass, I decide, huh, this is sort of interesting. I'll write a book about my grandfather, Leon, Lauterpacht, and Lemkin. And it would be a book about three men, two crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, and one city. And then as I was doing the research, a fourth man came into the story. By complete, uh, completely by accident, I wasn't prepared for it. On the 1st of August, 1942, a man called Hans Frank arrived in Lemberg, which had been newly incorporated into the German Reich, one from the Soviets, taken back from the Soviets. He comes to the university, the place that I'm invited, in fact speaks, I didn't realize it, or I speak 70 years later, in the very same room that he speaks in, and gives a big speech in the aula of the university to announce that in the next weeks and months, a million people will be killed. All the Jews of Galicia will exist no more. And he proceeds within a week to start that program. And in the course of the next weeks and months, amongst the million people who are killed are the entire families of Lauterpacht, Lemkin, and my grandfather, Leon. So this man, Hans Frank, becomes the fourth man in the story. And Hans Frank isn't just anybody. He is a remarkably interesting person. He was Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer from 1928 to 1933. He was a friend of the composer Richard Strauss. He was a man of deep culture and education, and yet he got involved in these terrible things. How is that possible? To then take the story forward beyond 1942, go forward three years to 1945, and again, you could not invent it. The great English historian, Anthony Beaver, very generously said of this book, if it was a novel, if it was fiction, you, would, you just simply wouldn't believe it. But what happens next is that Lauterpacht, the inventor of the concept of crimes against humanity, is hired by the British to be a prosecutor at the Nuremberg trial. And Lemkin, who works on genocide, is hired by the Americans to work as a prosecutor in the Nuremberg trial. 
And the two men are given the job of prosecuting Hans Frank. But they don't know on the day the trial begins that they are prosecuting the man who has killed their entire families. They only learn that nine months into the trial at the end of July 1946, which is, as you can imagine, for them personally, a very dramatic moment. So the book interweaves the unexpected and fairly remarkable coincidences of these four lives of human beings, whilst also, I think, telling a bigger story about identity and about silence. Sí, un, un observat que ni jo hagués fet tan bé aquesta introducció del seu llibre, no? <laughs> eh? Eh, de fet, hauria de seguir, no? M'està posant la meva feina molt fàcil, però anem, anem, jo crec que ja tenim aquí una imatge, una ciutat, Lviv, hem de recordar aquest nom, eh, un, 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 un avi, León, un expert eh, que es diu eh, Lauterpacht, el de Crims contra la Humanitat, un altre expert que es diu Lemkin, el del concepte de genocidi, i tenim el jerarca nazi, eh, Hans Frank, que va fer famosa la frase de dir, eh, davant de Hitler, va dir, a partir d'ara, estimar el Führer és un nou concepte legal. <laughs> no? eh? Eh, estimar el Führer eh, ha, ha esdevingut un terme legal. Eh? Aquest, aquest és l'escenari. Podríem anar-hi potser ara un, una mica, um, un per un, un per un, eh, d'aquests personatges. Uh, L'avi, aquí el tema de l'avi, uh, ho has mencionat abans, uh, llocs com aquest país uh, ha sigut sempre crucial el que aquest fil generacional tan fràgil i tan prim, a vegades l'avi és el que salva la memòria, a vegades l'avi és el que se'n va amb un secret, i és això. És molt significatiu que l'epígraf que ell posa en el, en el llibre eh, fa servir una cosa d'un un hongarès, em sembla que és un, un psiquiatre hongarès, un psicòleg hongarès, que diu, en la versió castellana, diu lo que atormenta no són los muertos, sinó los vacíos que dejan en nuestro interior los secretos de otros, no? Aquí tenim literatura encarnada, ell és un home que viu fins a 40 i pico d'anys amb una relació amb un avi que viu a París, aquest León, és el seu avi francès, el seu avi de París, no? l'avi de París, que no, té, que, i de sobre, que no li ha dit mai res ni de l'Evip ni de tota la seva família arrasada durant aquells anys allà. No? Per tant, Uh, a veure, comenta una mica el tema de l'avi, que en aquest cas és clarament el, el motor d'aquesta de, de, voluntat de posar-te a escriure una cosa personal. Tu, tu estaves acostumat a escriure coses acadèmiques, de tractats, i de cop i volta una persona vagament humana, no, una persona humana, uh, es, uh, es posa a parlar uh, amb ell mateix a partir d'aquest secret de l'avi, no? How did, com, com es va funcionar sure. això? So, it's... I mean, I, I knew my grandfather very well, and I loved him. I was very, very close to him. Um, but in writing this book, which took six, six and a half years to write, I learned things about him that filled out my sense of him. I'm very glad you started with that quotation, because halfway into writing this book, I came to understand, no, I'll put it differently. I came to have the sense that my grandfather had communicated things to me by means that I had not fully understood, or we can't understand. And so I asked a friend of mine who is a psychoanalyst to identify for me the writings in the field of psychoanalysis and psychiatry, which examined the relationship, not between parent and child, but between grandparent and grandchild. Because I had a sentiment that there was a special 
relationship. And I was amazed to be directed to the work of two Hungarian psychoanalysts, um, Maria Torok and Nicholas Abraham, who had devoted their lives to really exploring this relationship. And I read a lot of what they had written and was astonished to discover or read about their theory, which essentially says, and I'm simplifying, that someone who's been through a traumatic experience takes that experience, puts it into a crypt, shuts the door, locks the door, throws away the key, never talks about it, and assumes that it is gone forever, but it is not. It gets communicated not to the next generation, but to the next generation but one. And it is passed from the grandparent to the grandchild. And in ways unknown, the grandchild picks up information about what happened to the grandparent. It's completely fascinating. I had no idea about this work. So when I got that invitation and when I went to Lviv and when I went really with the aim only of wanting to find the house where my grandfather was born, because to understand the street on which my grandfather was born would be better to understand myself. And that's what I wanted to do. But in doing that, I uncovered family secrets. So in a sense, the book is a double detective story. There's the big political story, Lauterpacht, Lemkin, Hans Frank, the remarkable things that happen in a courtroom, that big drama. But there's a parallel story in the book. And I think you explained very generously at the beginning uh, the, the miracle of the writing. It's also, I think, fair to say that I'm very fortunate to live in a part of London in which my neighbours include such writers as John le Carré, who helps me in the writing of the book. And that means you are able to bounce ideas off someone who really knows how to structure a narrative that grips people. In preparing to go to Lviv for the first time, in the autumn of 2010, this was actually in the summer, I said to my mother, are there any documents from that period? I'd never seen anything. I was 50 years old. I had never seen a single thing. And she said, actually, there are. And she, we were in her living room, and she went in, into her bedroom, and she came back five minutes later with two big, very old briefcases full of paper which, you know, I'm a lawyer, I love being in court, I love documents and photographs and exploring and making connections between things. <clears throat> and so I started going through the paper and putting it all out on the floor, which I love doing. And very quickly, very quickly, I realized that the story that I had been told as a child was not true. I was basically told, and my brother was told, that at some point in 1939, my grandfather, who was then living in Vienna, had moved from Lemberg in 1914 with his mother and his two sisters. He was living in Vienna in 1939 with his, newly, his new wife, my grandmother, Rita, and their one-year-old child, my mother, Ruth. And somehow we had been told they all went together to Paris. This wasn't true. What I found in the papers were passports. And from the passports, I was able to work out they had left on different dates. My grandfather left in January 1939 by himself. My mother, aged one, traveled by herself from Vienna to Paris in July 1939, six months later. How? Who took her? How on earth did she get to Paris? And my grandmother stayed, which is a big deal for anyone who's a mother to imagine being separated from your one-year-old child in those circumstances at that particular moment. Why did she stay behind? So there's a whole other strand of the book 
which explores those three questions, mm -hmm. to which I get complete answers. I've, it took five years to find out everything, but I found out how my mother got from Vienna to Paris, basically taken by a truly remarkable human being, an evangelical Christian missionary who devoted her wartime years to saving anyone who was a victim of Nazism and never told a single person until it came out in my book, I discovered it. I also discovered, and there's a moral in the story here, if anyone's going to have an affair, don't assume that 75 years later, your grandchild can find out with 100% precision who you had the affair with and what happened, because that's what I discovered. My, my grandmother had an affair and my grandfather had a love. And that story is interwoven with the Nuremberg story. What it means is that I know my grandfather far better, but I also know people that I never knew, never met, and never talked about, like his mother. I'm often asked, if my grandfather were to turn up today and be sitting in that chair, what would I want to talk about with him? And the only question, or the first question I would put to him, would be the one thing I say with a sense of shame and deep sadness, I never asked him, what was your mother like? Because he never, ever talked about his mother. Because what happened to his mother was so painful to him that he could not talk about it. But I discovered also, with absolute certainty, 100%, what happened to her and how she ended up, remarkably, on a train from one concentration camp to an extermination camp with the three sisters of Sigmund Freud because they all happened to be members of the same group, elderly Viennese Jews who were being transported to their deaths. So it is fairly remarkable what you can discover 75 years after the events if you put enough time and effort into it. I això, I això va creant aquesta extraordinària talaranya entre eh, que, que és l'estructura del llibre, no? Entre eh, la veu privada, la veu pública, eh, els grans personatges de la història, els personatges familiars, eh, apareixen aquests secundaris de luxe. Ella ha mencionat aquesta dona angelical que va portar la, la seva mare a París quan tenia un any, no? Eh, és una altra aparició estel·lar en aquesta galeria de personatges, no? Miss Tilney of Norwich, Miss Tilney, no? of, Norwich. Miss Tilney of Norwich, yeah. una persona que de la que no sap res i que eh, tot comença quan ell troba una petita eh, cosa mig esborrada, un trosset de paper que diu Miss Tilney i una adreça, Norwich sense cap mena de connexió ni de res, i, i advocat com és i tal, comença, comença a rascar aquesta història i, i apareix. És de justícia poètica dir alguna cosa sobre Miss Tilney of, uh, uh, Tilney of Norwich. Uh, L'hem d'evocar avui a Girona un moment, perquè enmig d'aquesta història infernal, com s'explica que hi hagi gent que treballen realment com àngels i absolutament anònimament, no? Ens pots explicar quatre coses sobre Miss Tilney of Norwich? Um, I mean, I get, I get a huge amount of correspondence. I mean, I've written a lot of books. I've never had a reaction like this. It's been very interesting. Um, I had the great privilege of having an incredible editor. The book was edited in New York by a wonderful publishing house called Alfred Knopf. And Vicky Wilson there explained, just to put it in the context of the, you know, Andre Makin said he didn't think it was possible to write a novel in a day and a half, um, it, nor is it possible to write a non-fiction book, uh, I think a decent one in a year and a half. 
Um, th this book had four different drafts, each of 150,000 words, and they were different. And when Vicky Wilson in Knopf bought the first draft, she said, I'm buying it on one condition, which is that you completely rewrite it. <laughs> and, it and she was talking not about the substance, but the structure to help intelligent readers deal with the complexities of a trial for remarkable individuals, but also extraordinary points of detail. So I've learned from the cases that I do in international courtrooms that very often it is a single detail and a tiny detail which will transform the way a trial goes. And you've seen it, I'm sure, in your work in literature, English, Spanish, Catalan, that the reader's perception of an individual, of a moment, is transformed by the way you write about a tiny detail. And Vicky Wilson said many things to me, but one of the things she said was, Philippe, don't only tell people what you discovered, explain to them how you discovered it, because people are interested in that. They want to know how you found out about Miss Tilney. So I set it out in the book, and in fact, I found the answer to the question I was really looking for, which was, who took my mother from Vienna to Paris in July 1939, it was Miss Tilney. And I could have stopped writing about Miss Tilney at that particular point. But I'd sort of fallen in love with her. I couldn't stop researching her. I wanted to know what happened to her after she got back to Paris in July 39. In short, she carried on rescuing people and sending them off to different parts of the world. She then was caught by the Germans in September 1940 in Paris and imprisoned for four years in Stalag 127, in the course of which she saved more people's lives by hiding them, in one case, for a year in the cupboard in her room where she was being kept. She was then liberated by the Americans in autumn, August 1944, and she then decided to go back on, on mission and to be a missionary now in South Africa, in Botswana and Lesotho. And then she retired in 1965. And it's always the points of details that one loves. She retired to live with her brother, Fred, who was living in Coconut Grove, Miami, Florida. And Fred was a bodybuilder. It's, it's <laughs> always just the points of imagination. And he wasn't, he wasn't only any bodybuilder. He was actually a pretty famous bodybuilder because he was the man who discovered Charles Atlas. And he was Charles Atlas's best friend and his business partner. And Miss Tilney then lived the last years of her life in the company of... Brother Fred, who was married with kids, and Charles Atlas, which I just love. But one of the things that really interested me about Miss Tilney was why did she do what she did? What motivated her? It's a question we all ask ourselves. What, what makes people do what they do? Why do people behave as they do? So I got to know the archivist of the congregation in Norwich from where she came, an absolutely wonderful lady called Rosamond Codling. And over three years, we uncovered all the archives we could about Miss Tilney, and we discovered that her motivation was prompted by a single line of chapter 10, verse one, Paul's letter to the Romans, and her interpretation of a single sentence in the Bible. And she acted on that. That, for me, wasn't the end of the investigation. Because what I wanted to know was, was she motivated by what one might call 
ideology? Was she bringing Jews and Muslims to try to convert them to Jesus? Or was she motivated by just an ordinary sense of humanity? It didn't actually matter what the answer was. What she did was remarkable, why ever she did it. But, but I was curious. So I went to talk to another neighbor in the wonderful part of London that I live, who's also a wonderful writer who you may know, Jeanette Winterson, um, whose mother was an evangelical. Who's, actually, she was the only person I knew whose mother was an evangelical. And so I spent a whole afternoon with her going over all of the documents to try to get Jeanette's sense of what had really motivated Miss Tilney. And at the end of the day, going over pages and pages of writings and articles she'd written and letters she sent, she said, no, it's absolutely clear she was motivated only by one thing, humanity. If in the course of exercising her humane spirit, one or two people might come to Jesus, that would be great. But that wasn't why she did it. And it was that, again, tiny point of detail that I all put in the book and everything and explained that I think makes people feel a particular warmth to the remarkable mm. Miss Tilney. Y mientras, mientras la, 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 la Miss Tilney, mientras la Miss Tilney está intentando eh, o va salvant eh, centenars de personas, eh, tornem al, eh, a una de las bases del libro, y hay aquests dos eh, experts en lleis, el Lauterpacht y el Lemkin, que están, eh, como supongo que se entès al principio, que están intentando construir conceptos legales para que se pueda hacer justicia contra los jerarcas nazis en los judicis de Nuremberg. Eh, eh, tu no puedes decir, eh, desde un punto de vista de justicia democrática, supongo, no puedes decir, eh, oh, vengo aquí que el mataremos porque usted es un bruto, no? sino que has de construir el concepto legal. No? Y aquí aparece la feina de estos dos personajes, estos dos ligados en la VIP, como ya se ha explicado, eh, Lauterpacht, el de Crimes contra la Humanidad, y Lemkin. Eh, Sería interesante que, que, que nos comentéis las dos tan curiosamente diferentes y complementarias personalidades, tan jurídicas como personales, de Lauterpacht y Lemkin. Sure. I mean, they, they are both remarkable individuals. They're very different. I think if I had to have dinner with one of them, I would choose Lemkin, who would be much more entertaining dinner companion. <laughs> but in terms of intellectual rigor, probably Lauterpacht is the greater lawyer of the two. But I think to understand the two men, you've really got to go back to their origins. And I've been thinking about this just in the time, you know, being here in Catalonia and reading from London what's going on in this part of the world, because it's, it, there, are, and there are similarities there. You have to imagine what it was like in Lviv when they were there, okay? This was a very multicultural place. Basically, Lviv, at the end of the 19th century, right up until 1939, was divided about equally between three communities. Poles, Ukrainians, and Jews. And they sort of got on okay most of the time, but every few years there would be an, a sort of minor eruption of violence and killing and anger. But the essence of what motivated Lauterpacht and Lemkin was to understand the question, how can the law help people who associate themselves with different groups or communities to live together? Now, that is a question a lot of people are thinking about right now in Spain and in Catalonia, and it's the same question. How, how do we organize ourselves? Do we, do we decide that, in fact, we're going to have, that we live together and try to work it out, or that we separate out into our different groups so that each group lives in its own community. How, I mean, how do we begin to deal with these kinds of issues? And that issue became central in modern history in 1918. 
because for the first time, at the end of the First World War, the idea of rights of minorities, language rights, education rights, teaching rights, living rights, religious rights, the kinds of issues, frankly, Scotland and England are dealing with, Catalonia and Spain are dealing with, Northern Ireland and Ireland are dealing with, the kinds of issues were being discussed already then with solutions that now seem problematic. And the history of the last 100 years, in a sense, is the history of our efforts to try to work out how we answer those fundamentally complex questions. And Lauterpacht and Lemkin grappled with it and came out with different solutions. Lauterpacht's intellectual idealistic answer was we should all try to live together as individuals. Lemkin said, no, that's not how human beings are. People don't get killed because of what they have done as individuals or discriminated against or abused. They get abused and mistreated because they're a member of a group that is hated at a particular moment in time and place, and so the law must protect the group. And that tension between the two of them goes throughout the whole book. And, and in my writing of the book, I'm constantly in my own tension as to who am I with. Sometimes I'm with Lauterpacht, sometimes I'm with Lemkin. I never can quite make up my mind because I can see the force of both arguments. And the reason I think I can't quite make up my mind is in part because I, contrary to André Makin, don't have a clear sense of my own identity. Since Brexit, which you raised at the beginning, I actually feel less British and less French and much more European. That's what I feel, European. And it's caused me to reflect a lot on how I self-identify and which group I feel myself to be a part of. And to understand Lauterpacht and Lemkin, who came, I, I mean, it's a matter of speculation why they went in different directions. That's for others to think through. One had an urban environment, lived in town. The other lived on a farm in a rural environment. One was upper middle class, had money, had books. The other was completely poor. You know, what makes different human beings take different directions? That's a hugely complex issue. But they are absolutely fascinating. And again, it's the tiny points of detail that interest me the most about them. So, for example, Lauterpacht, there's a wonderful description someone writes of him in a letter. I don't know, some of you may have been to Cambridge or Oxford and have been to visit the colleges, and you know that inside the colleges there are courtyards, and the courtyards have grass on them. And the only people who can walk on the grass are the professors. The students and anyone who's less than a professor has to walk all the way around. So I get hold of a letter in which someone describes watching Hirsch Lauterpacht walk across the grass of Trinity College in the pouring rain with the grass completely soaked with water and he's walking with his shoes <laughs> like this so that he doesn't damage his shoes. Okay, and the shoes don't get wet and the leather doesn't get damaged in the water, which is like a totally crazy thing to do. Any normal person would walk all the way around. Why does he do it? He's doing it for the very obvious reason that it's a way of signaling to those others who happen to be there at the same time, I'm a professor. I can do this. So I'm an important person. And he does it because he's an outsider. He's insecure. He's come from this faraway place in the Ukraine and ended up as a famous professor at a famous university in England. And he feels insecure. And that says a lot for me about the kind of person that he was. Yeah, um, hi ha una, hi ha una tensió evident en, en, en tu mateix Uh, en el llibre en relació al concepte de genocidi. Eh? Estaves, uh, ara acabes de retratar Lauterpacht uh, 
com un tipus així molt preocupat per la seva pròpia posició i és el que potser intel·lectualment és més fi i legalment més fi, però Lemkin, que és el que genera el concepte de genocidi, es nota molt en el llibre que és el que anava a dir tortura quasi bé. Estàs torturat, mentre escrius el llibre, per si el concepte de genocidi realment és lícit o és una bona idea. Per què? Perquè si juguem a parlar de genocidis, estem apel·lant, evidentment, a una pulsió tribal. Si hi ha genocidi vol dir que hi ha ells i nosaltres. Hem de jugar a parlar de genocidi. És a dir, acceptem, per tant, que uns som uns i els altres som altres, com es gestiona això, no? I es nota molt que hi ha aquesta tensió, una tensió que, de tota manera, encara que intel·lectualment el preocupa amb ell, queda resolta en l'últim moment del llibre, jo crec, quan ell finalment visita... That's the Spanish one. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can read it in Spanish, because that's the best way to do it. I, last weekend I read it in German. I managed somehow to read it in German. Um, and maybe that will... And, and then I'll explain what the difficulty... Or maybe you should read it. Sí, home, you're, right. you're, I bet your Spanish is better than mine. M'he oblidat de dir al principi que és un tremendo fan del Girona. Why don't you read it? It's just from this bit. Just this bit to the end. Sí, sí. Sí, sí, ho llegirem de pressa perquè jo només podria llegir una frase. Perquè si faig en espanyol seria horrible. I no ho diria tot el paràgraf. Però no, és un moment important, perquè al final ell va amb dos personatges dels que hem de parlar, ara en parlarem després, però va amb un personatge i van en el lloc, una mena d'aigua moll, on a les afores de l'Evip... Why don't I... Just to explain the context and then... I'm explaining the context. But it's a different context because they haven't been explained about another point of connection. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. Just outside Lviv is a small town called Zhulkiev. And Zhulkiev is where Hirsch Lauterpacht was born. In doing the research for the book, I was astonished to discover, there were so many funny things that I discovered, that my great-grandmother was born in the same town and lived in the same town, Zhulkiev, population 6,000 or something, a very small town. So I thought that was pretty amazing. Then I discovered not only that they were born in the same town and lived in the same town, they were born and lived on the same street. And the street, and, and this was... The street was called Lembergerstrasse, which the great writer Joseph Roth called East-West Street, Calle Este-Westy, which is why the book has that title. The reason this is significant is that Hirsch Lauterpacht had only one child, and that child was called Eli Lauterpacht, and he was my first teacher of international law. And we knew each other for 30 years before we discovered that we could trace our origins to the same street. So I went to Zhulkiev and I learned there from a remarkable Ukrainian lady that right in the town is a mass grave of three and a half thousand people who were killed on the same day for being a member of the same group. And Ludmilla said, Would you like to go and see the mass grave? Hemos llegado. <laughs> Ludmila, eh, la que l'acompanyava, hablaba con voz queda. Allí estaban las charcas, dos grandes pozos de arena llenos de una extensión de agua oscura, lodo y cañas que se doblaban con el viento. Un lugar marcado por una única piedra blanca, erigida no por el municipio como expresión de aflicción o de pesar, sino como un acto privado de rememoración. Nos sentamos allí, sobre la hierba, contemplando cómo el sol caía sobre el agua oscura y estancada que se extendía firmemente sobre aquellas bocas de la tierra. Más abajo, intactos durante más de medio siglo, yacían los restos de las 3.500 personas sobre las que escribiera el largamente olvidado Gerson Taffet en el verano de 1946. Cada una de ellas un individuo y a la vez 
un grupo en su conjunto. Entre los huesos que yacían abajo se mezclaban los del tío de León, uh, Labi, uh, Leibus y el tío de Lauterpacht, David, que descansaban el uno junto al otro en este lugar simplemente porque eran miembros del grupo equivocado. Y ahora aquí las últimas líneas del libro. El sol calentaba el agua. Los árboles me elevaron hacia arriba alejándome de las cañas hacia el cielo de color añil. Justo allí, durante un breve instante, comprendí. Y os, os podría hacer entender que aquest comprendí él, de banda a estos 3.500 jueus que están enterrados allá, os podría hacer entender que aquest comprendí es finalmente, para decirlo así, la respuesta a donar validez a reconciliarse, yo creo, amb el concepto de genocidio. Es decir, es una putada, pero sí, pertenecemos a grupos de alguna manera. También es parte de la experiencia humana, es inevitable. Y en aquel momento, sembla que esta tortura técnica sobre si el genocidio es s'ha de considerar o no, pues, potser como mal menor, s'ha de considerar que existe. Y no? es una manera fabulosa de, de, de acabar el libro y muy emocionante. Nos están amenazando, pero si la gente ha vingut a las 10 de la nit, esta bujería, supongo que no hay... Ha... Vull... Aquest, si han vingut a las 10, deu... Pero bueno, no, nos quedan 5 minutos. Eh, y, y, sí, ¿no? Y no? porque hay muchas preguntas al público, hemos de hablar de cosas de actualidad, hemos de hablar de Cataluña un momento, porque es, es claro, nos interesa mucho por muchos conceptos. Eh, hay una cosa al final de este libro, el libro también... Eh, Tom, Tom va cap a un, un final extraordinario porque aparecen dos hijos de dos jerarcas nazis, aquest que ha mencionado él, el Hans Frank, que el van executar a Nuremberg, y tenemos la historia, ell los coneix, ell los contacta, dos hombres ara ja grans que se han hecho amigos, son hijos de dos nazis absolutos, y lo interesante es ver cómo cada fill gestiona de manera absolutamente oposada y diferente la memoria del padre. Un, el fill de Hans Frank, porta a la butxaca la foto del día que el van executar a Nuremberg eh, para poder se la treure en tant en tant y decir el, 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 el fill de puta del meu padre, sort que es mort. Eh? No fos cas que me el, el van executar y está mort y era un nazi, etc. Y el otro es el fill de un otro nazi que no puede no pot, malgrat toda la evidencia y todas la, las cosas que se le ponen al davant, no pot desvincularse de un sentimiento afectuoso en relación al su padre. El vol salvar como sigue, más igual. Ah, es sí, que es responsable de tal... Es igual, pero él lo va a hacer. Pero, eh, eh, y es un, es un, es un final eh, también, eh, eh, esta cosa. De fet, el, 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 el Philip Sanz ha fet una película, una mena de documental, sobre estos dos personajes y sobre esta gestión de la memoria, que es un, un otro documento eh, fascinante. Eh, potser podrías decir dos cosas sobre eso, de, de, del Nicolás, los dos hijos, eh, y llavors entraremos en cosas más de, de la actualidad. Well, you've, you've encapsulated very brilliantly, and, and I must say also, I, remarkable, you've interpreted the ending of the book exactly in accordance with my objectives. You've perfectly encapsulated it. So you, you've said it very well. I, I'll say only this. I mean, I have a very close and continuing relationship with both men, which is curious and complex. One has become a very good friend, Nicholas Frank. It is really curious that I, the grandson of a man who lost his entire family in that region because of the actions of Hans Frank, can now call Nicholas Frank a dear friend of mine. And he is. We've become really good friends. The other son is more complex. I have a good relationship with him. And I should tell you, I'm right now writing the sequel to this book, um, which takes the story on after 1946. Horst von Wächter's father, Otto, who was the deputy of Hans Frank and the governor of Krakow and Galicia, and indicted for the murder of hundreds of thousands of people, escaped in 1945. 
he went into the mountains of the Alps, helped by a young man called Burkhard Hartmann, a Waffen-SS soldier who was 19 in 1945 and who remarkably was still alive last year and who I interviewed. And after four years in the mountains, Otto Wechter came down from the mountains and decided that he would try to make his way to Argentina on something that is called the Rat Lines. And he made his way to Rome where he was taken in by a bishop who protected him and helped him gain the documents to allow him to travel to Argentina. As he was gathering those documents, he went to have lunch in July 1949 on a Saturday afternoon with someone he described only in his letters and diaries as an old comrade at a place called Castel Gandolfo, which many of you will know. A week later, Wechter was dead in a Vatican hospital. So the book that I'm now writing explores, with the help of the son who's given me access to the entire archive, 10,000 pages, explores what actually happened in the Vatican in those three months in July 1949. And it's, I think I can say, even more unexpected than this one. I learned things that I had absolutely no idea about. The heart of my relationship with Nicholas Frank and Horst von Wechter is trust. Somehow, over five years, we've built up a relationship of trust. We tell each other things, we disagree about things, sometimes very, very strongly, sometimes even violently, and we shout at each other. But we, on both sides, or on all three sides, know that we will be honest with each other, always, and fair with each other in how we deal with the material. And actually, I now have the role of a go-between, because Nicholas and Horst haven't talked to each other okay. for three years ever since Nicholas accused Horst of being a Nazi. A vegades la la a vegades diguem que la lo contrari the opposite of of lo contrari lo contrari de oblidar és recordar, no? En aquest llibre hi plana una altra idea en molt sentit i és lògic perquè l'ha escrit un home que es dedica a les lleis i és un advocat. La idea seria que potser el contrari d'oblidar no és... El contrari d'oblidar no és recordar, el contrari d'oblidar és justícia. I aquesta és la pregunta. És la justícia el que acaba curant els traumes a una víctima de segona generació, com series tu mateix, és la justícia el que acaba donant consol a aquests dos homes ara nascuts culpables perquè els seus pares eren nazis. La justícia i trauma, hi ha un espai aquí d'esperança, per dir-ho així? Bé, és una... It's such a huge question yeah. well, that I think the, the better thing might be, or the fairer thing, if there is a time for one or two questions. <laughs> I, I mean, we could just sí. literally spend hours talking about this. I mean, we were talking before sí. about justice. I was involved in the Pinochet case. There is the curiosity of a country, Spain, which has not come to terms with what happened within its territory 80 years ago pointing the finger at another country, Chile, and saying, since you can't do justice in your country, send them to us and we'll do justice in relation to your people. There's obviously a, an issue. <laughs> and uh, that raises in a globalized system. Sí, jo crec que podem, podem obrir el, el, el d'això a qüestió... De, amb, 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 per, per parlar una mica de, del nostre propi país i de la, de la situació, jo crec que el seu punt de vista pot ser molt interessant en la perspectiva que té. No sé si eh, saps que en el llibre parles dels catalans. 
Llegiré una cita del llibre en què es mencionen els catalans. This is 1919, it's amazing. Ah, la recordes. Fixeu-vos que és molt curiosa. Està parlant de... El presidente Wilson propuso un tratado especial que vinculara la pertenencia de Polonia a la sociedad de naciones al compromiso de dar un trato igualitario a las minorías nacionales y raciales. Wilson contó con el apoyo de Francia, pero Gran Bretaña, los seus amics, Gran Bretaña se opuso, temerosa de que a continuación se otorgaran derechos similares a otros grupos, como, cito, o citaba el informe de los británicos, los negros americanos, los irlandeses del sur, los flamencos y los catalanes. Per tant, si volen preguntar, ara és el moment, tenim una estoneta. Allà darrere hi ha una pregunta. I have a question, but it's not about Catalunya, I'm sorry. It's about your mother. I'm very curious about how far she know about her parents and how did she take all this news about her life? Thank you for asking that question. It's, it's a very important question. Um, I, I did a panel this week in London. It was really interesting about writing memoir and what rights does a child have to tell a story that is not just his story, my story, but also his mother's story and his grandparents' story when it involves issues that are intimate and personal and complex. So my mother was a hidden child. When she was brought to Paris in the summer of 1939, she was then, after the Germans arrived in June 1940, hidden in a place called Meudon in a series of Catholic families who saved her, hid her through the war. She has no memory, she says, of the first six years of her life. And that's a common, I've seen that also in Rwanda, in Yugoslavia, in other places. This is not just this, it's a very common theme. And she then grew up, and it's plain that she knew things had happened, but I think it's fair to say was probably too frightened to open the door and explore them. She knew, for example, although she had only told me after, I discovered it was writing the book, or she thought that her mother had had an affair. And she was incredibly frightened that her mother had had an affair with a Nazi because she felt on top of everything that had happened and her sense of having been abandoned by her mother when she was a year old, to have been abandoned for the love of a Nazi would have been more than she could bear. But, and I'm not going to give away what I discovered because I did it once and then I got told off, but it was plain that the act, when I said to her, are there any documents? And in, incidentally, I know we were talking before, I've had really interesting correspondence from Argentina and Chile, from people who are in similar situations but in relation to those countries and the events in the 70s and the 80s, asking me exactly the same kinds of questions. So when I ask her, are there any documents, she could have said, nothing, no. And there'd have been no book. I, I mean, I wouldn't have had anything. I wouldn't have been able to find the address where he lived, basically, but for that material. And I interpreted what she was doing was giving me a son she trusted the right to explore these issues with the understanding that I would share with her what I had found, which of course I did. At a particular moment, I found myself in an acutely difficult situation. There was evidence <coughs> that my mother's father might not be the person she had always thought it was, that she might have had another biological father. And having discovered the identity of my grandmother's lover, 
living in Massapequa, New York, the lover's granddaughter said to me, let's do a DNA test and see if we're related. So I really hesitated at that point. Not I mean, for me, it wouldn't be an issue. But if I were to go down that route, I would be imposing upon my mother, possibly, a new piece of information which at the end of her life could be absolutely devastating. So I thought, whoa, 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 what do I do here? So we ended up sending off for the DNA samples, the, the kits. It turns out to be quite difficult to do. And they arrived, and about a day after they arrived, the lady from Long Island sent me an email saying, I did the swabbing in my mouth with the Q-tip five minutes after the package arrived. What about you? And I did nothing for six months. I was paralyzed. I, I was completely paralyzed. So I then, in the end, after long conversations with people I trust, my wife, various friends, who all said to me, Philippe, the thing you always say is that dealing honestly with material is important. I had to do it. So I did it. And that was very, very complex. Um, fast forward, and I'll leave a gap so you can work out for yourselves what happened in due course. What's been very interesting since the book has come out, and it has come out um, way beyond any, I mean, it's a very private book. I, you know, I've written lots, we've written, we're academics, we're used to writing books that sell 812 copies and we're completely happy that it's sold as many as that. So this is on a different scale and just translated now, I think, into 20 languages and has sold now hundreds of thousands of copies. And what's been interesting for her is that the sky has not collapsed. Quite the contrary. She gets communications from people saying, what an extraordinary person your father must have been. And she walks with a bigger spring in her step. And of all the things that have made me happy about this book, that is the thing that makes me happiest, is that it's like this terrible thing that you couldn't talk about these terrible secrets that were shameful, these things that had happened to the family, the things we knew about, the things we didn't know about, have been spoken about openly, read by hundreds of thousands of people. And not only has life gone on, but it's gone on in a decent sort of way. I think part of the reason that has happened is the style that I adopted very consciously in writing the book, which is very detached in an emotional sense from the material that I am describing. And it's influenced very heavily by a book that I think everyone ought to read right now for this moment by someone who I think is one of the great writers of the 20th century, and that's Stefan Zweig and a book um, called The World of Yesterday in English. I don't know what it's trans... It's definitely in Spanish, but it's Stefan Zweig's The World of Yesterday. Mondo de ayer, sí. Yeah. When you're writing about things that are appalling, I think you have to strip the emotion out of it. And I decided I would not judge anybody in the book because I do not know what I would have done at a similar moment. If I had been my grandmother, what would I have done in July 1939? I don't know what I would have done. And I think that that style of writing has made it much more accessible. And it, it relates to the point about the sons of Frank and Wechter. I don't, they're not responsible for what their fathers did. And even in my writings about the two fathers, who were remarkably cultured and intelligent and highly educated men. I don't use adjectives like appalling or dreadful or ghastly or murderous. Or, it's just the facts, just the facts. And I think that's 
contributed. I've asked myself long and hard, why has it had the reaction that it has, which was totally unexpected. And, and it's the consciously chosen style of writing, assisted by an absolutely brilliant editor. I was incredibly lucky to have the editor that I had. Sí, com, com en la gran literatura, els moments més emocionants d'aquest llibre són d'autors directes de la contenció narrativa. No? És en la contenció, els que heu llegit el llibre, és en la contenció narrativa que realment el lector sent l'emoció. No? I per això és un llibre que l'ha canviat amb ell, però canvia a qualsevol persona que, que el llegeixi. Uh, Això de Catalunya, que no ho deixem estar, o què? Uh, about, uh, If anyone's got a question about Catalunya... Fem, I mean... fem una de general, si voleu, però, però no d'això. És a dir, la, la, la situació de Catalunya des del punt de vista... És a dir, hi ha sectors del moviment independentista que tenen expectatives sobre les, uh, la justícia internacional en relació a les seves aspiracions, etc. etc. Uh, en, la, en la seva perspectiva professional, uh, com, com veu això? És a dir, hi ha, hi ha un cas, uh, diguem-ne, perquè el conflicte que estem vivint uh, tots en aquest país uh, pugui agafar una dimensió internacional, europea com a mínim? I mean, we talked about it a little bit when we were talking at tea time. I mean, international law is an inherently conservative creature. International law doesn't like instability. And the reason international law, modern international law, doesn't like instability is modern international law has a long memory in relation to 1939 and 1914. And there is built into the system a sense that things can very easily spiral out of control. And I think, I think frankly, we're beginning to see that right now. You can see the little things that are happening in which one can begin to imagine, even if we're not back in the 1930s, things could very easily spiral out of control. Now, there are people out there who want things to spiral out of control. There are people in my country, you know, who want the mayhem of Brexit because it will lead to a reordering of Europe. There are people, I'm sure, in Russia who would like a reordering. There are people in the United States who would like a reordering. Maybe there are people in this country who would like a reordering. We know that a reordering on that scale comes with blood. That, that's the crucial thing. So if we're going to open that door, let's open that door knowing what the consequence is going to be. When different communities come into conflict, if you, if, you, if you read this book, you'll see the analogies with the present time. You'll see communities in this region of Galicia, in what is now the Ukraine, Poland, Ukraine, Austro-Hungary, struggling with the question, how do we keep it together? How do we avoid the bloodshed? How do we live together? Do we chop ourselves up into lots of different countries? Do we just create one big country where everyone lives together? It's basically the same issues that we're all thinking about. And they got it terribly wrong back then. And 60 million people died as a consequence of them getting it wrong. Now, I'm not saying that that will happen again, but I am saying Whatever direction we decide we're going to take, let's be fully aware of what the consequences may be. Europe's capacity for mayhem and mass killing has not changed. It's just below the surface. So if we're going to open those doors, let's know what doors we are opening. And I think that what international law does, if nothing else, is it gives us pause for thought. It basically says that an existing state continues to exist unless that state signals to a community or group or part of that state that they're free to decide whether they want to live separately. That's basically, I've chosen my words very carefully, the balance that is created. And, and we know that it sort of works and sort of doesn't work and it creates extraordinary tensions not just in this country but in Scotland 
in Northern Ireland. I mean, right now, if you want to find the one part of the world in Europe where the debate is as febrile as it is here, go to Belfast. Because right now, in Belfast, on the question of how Brexit has an impact, you are talking about reopening the blood gates. It's right on the cusp. Because if the British government does anything that suggests that Northern Ireland has a long-term future united with the rest of Ireland, there will be blood. It's not uh, speculation. It, that is what's going to happen. And it will be very, very nasty. So international law doesn't have a simple solution. International law has struggled for at least 100 years with dealing with this question. And when we were talking before about whether or not you were asking me whether I thought particular individuals who were being held right now in detention were political prisoners, I sort of turned around the question. I said, well, international law doesn't have a concept of political prisoners. International law recognizes that every human being, because of the work of Lauterpacht and others like Lauterpacht and states, have minimum rights. Rights not to be detained without charge, rights to be told what the charge is, right to a fair trial, right to a quick trial, right to a balanced tribunal, and so on and so forth. And what I said to you before was that, looking at what was going on in Spain right now, it seemed to me there's a problem on that front. I'm not saying there are political prisoners, I'm saying there are serious issues about the conditions in which certain people are being detained and the conditions under which they are being detained, which under modern international law would not appear to be acceptable. And then when I hear on top of it about a blogger who is jailed for three and a half years for writing a song, I mean, that's what they do in Saudi Arabia. Okay, that's not what they do in Europe. There is a problem. And it, it's going to require people to be, to dig very deep and to dig very generously to avoid things spiraling out of control. And I think the society as a whole has to decide whether it wants to open those floodgates to mayhem or step back. And it's not for an outsider to say what any country should do or what any region within a country should do. All I would say is the story here is a very familiar story. And sometimes it's useful to go back and read what has happened in the past to see what the dangers as well as the possibilities are. Because the government of Spain too is subject to constraints and it cannot forever simply say it's unacceptable that Catalonia does this, that or the other. So there is a, a real complexity. It, it's, it, these are really big and complex questions. Um, em diuen que, que, que hauríem d'acabar malgrat tot. Uh, farem una cosa l'any uh, 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 que, que ve li direm que torni i, i parlarem d'en Pinochet i del cas del Pinochet que és la cosa més fascinant que li ha passat amb ell i que és un altre llibre així de, així de gros. Uh, em sembla que he dit que seria un privilegi, em sembla que ho ha sigut i li vull agrair en el Filip aquesta estada aquí. Moltes gràcies. Gràcies.